Number one, root 72. From here, you can see there's a big square number I can take out of it. What can you see? 36. The square root of 36 uh, can be pulled out. Uh, the square root of 9 can also be pulled out, but 36 is bigger. So you might as well do that if you can see it. If I take the square root of 36 out, what is the square root of 36? It's 6. So this is 6 root 2. There's also a square you can take out of this, namely... 4. 4. Very good. So I'm going to take the square root of 4 out. The square root of 4 is 2. So 4 times 2 is 8. Do you agree with that? Yeah. That's just the number at the front. Once I've taken the square root of 4 out though, what's left underneath the square root? The root 2. And that's why, can you see? You have 6 over here, take away 8 of them. That's why you have minus 2 of them at the end. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, uh, second one, actually a little bit easier. So you can see uh, Leo, I think, root 5 times root 10. He's seen root 50 has a big square number you can take out, namely 25. Very good. So he's taken the square root of 25 out. There it is right there at the front. Root 2 is left behind. There's not much that required, is required here. You can't take any square numbers out of root 10, so you're done. Okay. Right, let's finish this out then. Let's do all the working this time since I don't have anything to go off. I'm going to do these one at a time with my pairs of terms, okay? So root 6 times 4 root 2, what would you like me to write? 4 root 12. 4 root 12, which you might be thinking, I can simplify that in the next line, so we'll come to that in a minute. Root 6 times 3, 3 root 6. You're again thinking there's not much I can do with that, so that's fine. And then I'm going to do the second pair now. Don't forget, both of them have a minus. 5 attached to them. So this will become minus 1. 20, 20 root 2. We remember that our whole numbers out the front we deal with and then our thirds we deal with separately. So that gives you the 20. What about here in the end? 15. Cool. Minus 15. Minus 15. Okay. Now when you have a look down the list, this is fine. This is also fine. Can't take anything out of that. How about this? Fine. It's just this guy that you need to muck around with. So what square number would you like me to take out? Four. So the square root of four will be two. So two times four is eight. What does that leave you with on the inside? Three. So now when you have a look at the whole thing, is there anything I can collect together? No. I'm done. That's it. Okay, are you happy? The heading is rationalizing the denominator. That's the way that you read this. Bit of a mouthful. I just want you to think for a moment about all of the fractions that you've ever had to deal with. Now, when you work with fractions, <laughs> when you work with fractions, and you look at the denominators of those fractions, we want a couple of things. So, if I gave you a fraction like, say, 6 over 8, 6 over 8, most of you would instinctively say, I can write that simpler. How can you write 6 over 8 in a simpler way? You could go 3 over 4, right? Because both of them, uh, we might just write an example. Both of them are divisible by 2, yeah? So you divide them both by 2, and that gives you an equivalent fraction, right? So we want, what, what is it that makes this better than this? We want it to be a smaller number, a smaller denominator as possible. So we want the smallest denominator. Can anyone give me a reason why smaller denominators are objectively better than bigger denominators? Like, what's wrong with 6 over 8? <coughs> why is 3 quarters better than 6 over 8? Hmm. Well, if, for example, I was adding this guy to some other fraction, don't write this, but if I were adding this together with, oh, I don't know, something like this, no, this is the same fraction. Now you can see, you know how you do that exercise with working out common denominators, right? Common denominators? It might not be immediately obvious to you that these will have the same common denominator once you simplify stuff out. But if you write each of them with the smallest denominator possible, then you'll see, oh, this is 3 quarters. This is also 3 quarters. So you don't need to change those denominators at all. You don't have to say, oh, what's 8 times 400? Hmm, 33,200, and then you change all of these. The numbers get bigger and bigger and it becomes more and more confusing. That's why smaller denominators are better. 
something else that you might have seen before, not very common, but if I said to you, okay, here's a fraction now, 3 over 2 take away 5. Okay? Now, can you tell me what's that equal to? Can you tell me at least what the next step is? Yeah, very bigger up than me. <laughs> okay, this is a denominator. I can combine those terms, can't I? So that's going to be 3 over negative 3, right? Which in turn is negative 1. Okay. Now, in this case, you can see it's just a bit weird having that negative sign on the denominator, right? So not only do we like to have small denominators, we also like to have positive denominators. You've actually rewritten this number with a positive denominator, namely 1. Okay. So we want small denominators. We also want positive denominators. Okay. Want them to be small, want them to be positive. I'm going to add one more thing to the, um, to the mix. And I can't give you an example just yet. That's what the rest of this board will be about. Not only do we want them to be small and positive, but it would also be nice we want rational denominators. In other words, we want to avoid surds and other kinds of irrational things on the denominators for all the same reasons that you just noticed before. It's hard to work with the denominators if they're not rational, right? As an example, you can write this over on the right hand side. If I said to you, what are these two things, right? That's really troublesome to deal with. You're going to get a bit of a mess when you try and put these two things together. But if they're both rational, 5 and 7, instead of root 5 and root 7, this would be much, much easier. So, underneath that, you can make a little subheading, which is how to rationalize. Okay. Now, in fact, I, I am going to steal this example over here. If you wanted to add these two together, okay, how do I change a fraction so that its previously irrational denominator can become rational? Delage. I'm just the serve like the denominator. Okay, very good. Did you notice the thing you can do with fractions over here is if you multiply the top and the bottom by the same thing, it's still the same number. Do you agree? Like I can multiply both these numbers by two, fraction hasn't changed. It just looks a bit different. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this guy and go over here. And if I multiply the top and the bottom by as Delage suggested, root 5, the same denominator, I'm going to get 3 root 5 on the top. What will I get on the denominator? 5. five. Because root 5 times root 5, that's the number that when you multiply it by itself gives you 5. What about the other fraction? How could I rationalize that? Hmm. It's 4, root, four on root 7. Four root seven. Okay. So if I multiply the top and the bottom by root 7, then on the bottom, I won't have an irrational in number anymore. I'm going to have 7. Okay. So maybe if you like, I'll put in the intermediate line just to help you see it, right? This guy here is 3 on root 5. I'm going to multiply the top by root 5, which means I better multiply the bottom by root 5 as well. Why do you do that? Okay. Because rational denominators, just like positive ones and small ones, are easier for me to deal with. Okay? I can compute with them a lot more quickly. I don't have to think about third laws. I can just think about them as regular fractions. Okay? So I did that to the first number. I did the same thing to the second one. It used to be 4 over root 7. So I multiply the top and the bottom by root 7. <coughs> like so. Okay? Which leads me to this line. All right. So what I have done is I've changed the denominators so that they're not irrational anymore. They're rational now, which is why it's called rationalizing the denominator. Okay. Um, you could potentially, if you wanted to, from here you could now add these. What common denominator would you choose for these two fractions? Here you choose 35, right? So I'd multiply this one by 7 over 7. So it would become 21 root 5 on 35. What do I multiply this one by? 5. Okay, yes, 
but no. I'm actually multiplying by 5 over 5. Do you agree? Because otherwise I'm actually changing the fraction. But 5 over 5 is just 1, so it doesn't change the value. So that's going to become 20 root 7 on 35. Is that okay? Top and bottom. Top and bottom. Um, I've run out of space on the bottom of my board here, but now that they're both over 35, I can just combine those two things up the top. Like so. Okay. Sorry, I ran out of space to write that nice and neatly down. Okay. But let's just review. If you get given a pair of fractions and one or both of them have irrational denominators, certs, then if you just multiply by the right cert, you'll turn them into rational denominators. Generally, you want whole numbers. And then you can do whatever you want with that fraction. You can combine them and so on. Okay. Here are two fractions. 3 on root 2, 7 on 3 root 5. What they want us to do is rationalize the denominator of each one. So let's have a look at this one first. I'm going to multiply the top and the bottom by something that will change the denominator to be a rational number, not a third anymore. So can someone tell me what should I multiply by? What over what? Root 2 over root 2. Okay? So you can see on the top, just like always with fractions, you're going to have 3 times root 2. That's good. What do I get on the denominator? 2. two. That's it. Done skis. Okay? It's rational. I'm finished. Alright? Have a look at this one. Actually, I'm not going to write that yet. I want to multiply by something over something so that I make the denominator Rational. Now, what's the irrational part? It's just root 5. So I'm going to multiply by root 5 over root 5. Now, this is going to get us an additional step. Just watch what happens. Numerator? 7 root 5. 7 root 5. That's not hard. But on the denominator, don't forget, this 3 over here, he's still hanging out there. He doesn't disappear. So it's going to be 3 times 5, which is... Done. Okay. Occasionally, <laughs> occasionally, the particular combinations of thirds you've got will mean that I might have some extra simplifying to do. Like if that was 6, for example, you would have simplified that earlier. But 6 and 15 have a common factor, and you could cancel them out.